Okay, welcome everybody. It's uh, 3.15, so I'll go ahead and get started. Um, hope you guys are all enjoying the conference so far, day one, big time. You are in the Mechanisms of Biological Fertility session, conference room two. So uh, this presentation, I've got a few slides I'm going to buzz through pretty quickly at the beginning, just because there's information that I like to share with everybody who's interested in farming or is a farmer, and uh, I think it frames, gives you a little idea of what my background is and how I think about and approach farming. Um, and there's some other random things at the beginning. It'll tighten up about midway through. But this is what we have pretty pictures of uh, microbes to look at. And if this loads, this is what under my microscope they actually look like. <laughs> and the primary point of that is just to say, these little critters are very small, and they are hard to see. And please come in and have a seat well, if you like. Yeah, go ahead. I can't really they're really neat. Everything moving in this in this little video slide. This is from a cheap microscope I found on Craigslist. I think I paid hundred dollars for it. Cleaned it up, pulled a sample of compost uh, from my home compost bin, shook it up in a test tube, let it settle a little bit, drew off with a dropper, and that's one drop of uh, of liquid in there. So I can't identify anything in that slide. <laughs> and you're going to see a lot more pictures that are much more uh, interesting to look at. So my name is Peter Bresney. Um, there are all the internet things up there. You can reach out to me any way you want. There's a lot of information on our little farm website. Um, I always like to know what the educational background and where people are coming from who's given a presentation when I'm in the audience. So I put all this stuff up here. I have a lot of heavy reductionist pure science in my background. But the hardest earned degree of all was trying to make a farm profitable. <laughs> and I'm still not there yet. Um, as you can see, what I found at this little farm, which is uh, 17 acres, mostly wooded, just outside of Asheville, North Carolina. There's maybe two that I can actually grow on, and I'm actually growing in about 4,000 square feet right now, just in a homestead mode for myself. Because we spent all that money on a great farm, and then we didn't have any money to fix up the house. <laughs> so uh, we're taking it slow. Both my wife and I still have um, off-farm off jobs, um, but we are a regenerative focused, certified, naturally grown um, vegetable farm, despite the funny name. We chose the name to make people smile when they saw it. Uh, we have no, no animals out there except for honeybees. And we're still in homestead mode since the pandemic. I was all geared up to go um, sell as much as I had ever done before, direct to restaurants. And the week before I harvested my first round, all the restaurants shut down in Asheville. So like everybody else, I flipped over to uh, a little mini CSA for all my friends and family on the block, and then since then I've just kept it in homestead mode. And I'm going to catch up on infrastructure. It's right there on the internet. What do you know? <laughs> all right. So first of all, I really want to give a big shout out to everyone in this room. Farmers are amazing. I don't care your education level, your background, where you're from, your genetics, any of that doesn't matter at all. We're here to try and produce amazing, healthy food and share that with our community. So. We've got more in common than any of our differences. Let's focus on that always. Nobody knows more about your farm than you do. On the range of people that might give you advice from expert to your friends, you're right here. And we all have to listen to what everybody tells us and pick the right thing for our operation. So respect to all of you. Just a little bit of housekeeping. I'm hoping that we'll spend about 45 minutes on this presentation and 30 minutes on exercising questions just so everybody gets to know each other a little bit more and can think about problems on their farm. And I put this up here. You are not allowed to feel judged or criticized or shamed in this class. <laughs> I, when I first started farming, I have no farming background whatsoever. And I was constantly thinking, I wasn't good enough. I can't do this. I don't know what I'm doing. And that didn't get me anywhere. It didn't help my operation one little bit. If you so much as take a bottle of goat milk to your neighbor and trade it for some carrots, in my book, you're a farmer. <laughs> I am also really passionate about learning about pre-contact indigenous cultures in the Americas. And this is a zoom in from nativeland.ca, a really cool website that shows the indigenous communities that lived on a piece of land anywhere on the planet. And here's Carrie and Raleigh 
Durham is somewhere around in here. There were nine different nations that stewarded this land before we got here. And that's what it looks like for North America. There were a lot of people before us. So here's to our ancestors, ourselves, and the future generations who, were, who will steward this land indefinitely. Now, some big picture context before we get directly to uh, mechanisms of biological fertility. These are the things that I keep in mind that really have shaped the way I keep myself happy on the farm. If you think you can, or if you think you can't, who knows the answer to this question? You're right. That's exactly it. So if you think you can succeed at something, you're going to find a way to do it. If you tell yourself, oh, I can't do it that way, well, you probably won't be able to. Use your imagination. If we can't conceive of something before we try it, are we even going to try it? No. And paradigm blindness. This is a tricky one for me, and I'll have maybe another little example later on. Um, what's it feel like to breathe air? Yeah, really good, but do we know anything else? We don't. So that, that sort of goes back to using your imagination, trying new things. We might be stuck in a rut and not even realize it. So try and figure out what your blind spots are and correct them. And this, I don't know if you saw on my education page, I was fortunate enough to get into Nicole Masters, the author of For the Love of Soil, her first um, CREATE course, which trained farming-oriented people to become coaches and consultants for people that want to transition from chemically dependent farming to regenerative approaches. And her, her big thing that she came up with are the five M's, mindset, which influences microbes, minerals, organic matter, and management. If you put all that together, you can have a vibrant farm. Coming from a pure science reductionist background, Energy balance is really important. And not all of us stayed awake in our physics class when we talked about thermodynamics. So let's break it down. What happens if the cheetah spends more energy chasing that gazelle than the energy he gets out of eating that gazelle? It, it starves to death, right? So before 1945 in this country, for every 20 joules, if you don't know what a joule is, that's OK. It's just a measure of a quantity of energy Every 20 joules of fossil fuel we consumed, we produced about 40 joules of food. That's pretty good. I mean, twice the return using all that sunlight energy, not bad. Ooh. That's where we are today. So is that a sustainable situation? No. This is what drives me on the farm to try and do better. We've got to figure out a way to turn this around. And in my mind, it comes down to how we measure efficiency. Are we talking about energetic efficiency or are we talking about economic efficiency? Clearly, people are making money putting 100 cows on an acre and trucking in their food and trucking away their waste and filling them full of antibiotics, making their lives miserable, but it's economically efficient to produce. But how much money and energy do you spend, mostly energy, trucking that grain in, trucking the waste out, all of the things that we do thanks to cheap fossil fuels. So we've got to figure this out. Outcomes-based farming. And this was a real revelation to me. I didn't know what that was until I took that CREATE course. And we're basically talking about ecological outcomes verification, if any of you guys follow savory stuff. Um, outcomes-based farming versus practice-based farming allows you to embrace the mystery of nature because you don't have to know how it works. You just have to measure the outcome. So at the end of every year, you dig a hole in your field, you do a visual soil assessment. Is my soil getting better? That's the easiest way to tell if your farm is improving year on year. <laughs> if the answer is yes, keep doing what you're doing. If the answer is no, it's time to change. So this, this is just to say, embrace that mystery. Um, Dr. Christine Nichols at the Acres Conference last year said this is the only profession, she's a soil scientist, that you can get stupider every year the more you work. <laughs> because every year, you know, she went into it after she got her PhD, she was like, I think we know about 5% of what happens under our feet in the soil. Now she thinks we understand maybe 1% of what's actually happening under there. It's very complex and really interesting. So it's okay if you don't understand all the chemistry, all the physics, all the microbiology. 
as long as you monitor your progress with something that you can understand, you can improve your operation. I'm going through this pretty fast. So there's adaptive management. I think it was Lundgren at the last Acres conference who said that if you don't experience one failure a year, you're not trying hard enough, which is just to encourage everyone to experiment and do it in a safe way. You know, are you going to put, if you've got 1,500 acres, are you going to put 1,000 acres into a new experimental practice first year? No. Maybe choose 10. Something that you can afford to have a complete total loss on. And if it works, great. If it doesn't, learn from it. Try it again. So for the rest of this class, I want you guys to ask yourselves, what are the challenges on your farm or operation to increasing biological fertility opportunities for your plants? And then ask yourself, how can you overcome them? And you may bump into some paradigm blindness with that. So just keep that question, those questions in mind as we proceed. Now, here's another big picture thing that I always like to throw out there. What is your primary job as a farmer? Somebody tell me. Leave the land better than you found it. Leave the land better than you found it. That's great. I love that. Anybody else? Yeah. Take care of, my family. Take care of your family. Absolutely. Anybody else? Harvest the sun's energy, that's what I wanted to hear. It's photosynthesis in my book. Because if you cannot push that reaction as far as possible to, the, to our right, you're not going to harvest those crops. You're not going to be able to feed your family. You're not going to be able to improve your land. Photosynthesis is what plants give to us. They are the producers on this planet. And it's absolute magic. So how do you optimize it? That's my wife, Trina early on at our little farm with a bunch of flowers and all kinds of other tasty things. We all know about these, right? Who can name the five soil principles? I should have not put that up yet. <laughs> <laughs> Who can name them? Keep the soil covered. Diversity. Diversity, good. Minimize disturbance and? Animal integration. Animal integration and? living roots year round if you can possibly get them in there and the this is from nrcs i just used theirs a lot of people have five that fifth one is animal integration that is really important stuff way more important than i think a lot of us realize but my reductionist scientific mindset even though i'm working hard to embrace holistic and all the big picture stuff at the same time it would not let go of why do we want all this diversity? Why do we want to keep the soil covered? Why do we want all that microbiology in there? I agree with all of it. I never questioned any of it, but I still wanted to know why. And then I met this guy. <laughs> Have anybody you heard of Dr. White from Rutgers University? Woo! His, his talk at the Acres Conference last December was worth the price of admission for the entire conference and pre-conference <laughs> university. One, half, one and a half hour talk was worth it all. And that really inspired me to put this slideshow together. And I called Mary Beth at CFSA and I was like, I'm on fire. I got to <laughs> share this information with more people because I had no idea that this was happening in our plants. And I mean all of our plants. What are the function of roots? We all know what roots do, right? Basic stuff. They hold up the plant. <laughs> they do nutrient absorption. They take in water. They breathe. Maybe not all of us knew that, but they do. But are they predators? <laughs> yes. This is crazy. I had never heard this. Do they maintain the internal plant microbiome? Yes, they do. These are roots we're talking about. I had never heard of this stuff, and it just lit me on fire. Do they feed other organisms in the soil? Yes, they do. In fact, some plants, I've seen ranges from 20 to 60% of the total photosynthetic capacity of a plant is just pushed out into the soil. I think the average is probably around 30%. That's crazy. <laughs> Would you take 30% of your paycheck and just walk down the street and say, here you go, <laughs> here you go, here you go, have it, that's fine, it doesn't matter. <laughs> I'll, get, I'll get more tomorrow. I, it just, it blew my mind, I couldn't believe it. So this is my paradigm blindness right here. I don't know how that plant feels. I don't know what he's doing with his roots. Uh, here I am anthropomorphizing already. I'm calling it a hymn. That might just be a plant. It might be a sheep plant. I don't know. 
plant roots are micro microbial nurseries. The guy that wrote teeming with uh, bacteria calls plants uh, microbial ranchers. So that's why I've got a picture of cows down in Mexico. They secrete exudates to attract bacteria to them. They invite those bacteria into the root tips just behind the meristem. And I'm a biochemist, okay? So all of this microbiology and plant stuff is very new to me. If there's an expert in the room that knows more, please correct me, don't let me say anything wrong. They differentiate and kill undesirable bacteria inside the root and then digest them for their own fertilizer. <laughs> this is crazy, this is science fiction stuff. How do they know what's a good bacteria and what's a bad bacteria and separate them out? They create nurseries for this beneficial bacteria and then they grow up massive populations of these beneficial bacteria within the root hairs and inject it back into the soil so it repeats the process all over again. These beneficial bacteria that the roots invite into their system also get circulated throughout the plant and perform nitrogen fixation throughout the plant, even in their root hairs. What's even more interesting to me is that this is a vertical transfer of bacterial support systems. Those plants will then preserve the beneficial bacteria within their seeds. And the bacteria will go into a dormant state and wait till the, the seed germinates again, where they will resume this process of supporting the plant. And the weight of living microbial biomass in healthy soil is the equivalent of two cows per acre. So when I first started farming, I was like, wow, I really need to increase my organic matter because that's really important. That's a soil organic matter boost, right? For every percent of organic matter increase, percent carbon increase in your soil, you can capture another 20,000 gallons of water. Who doesn't want to have that much extra water per acre? <coughs> There's a great joke that Nicole told us one time. She's talking about an old cantankerous farmer in Australia, and somebody asked him, how much rain do you get putting from around there? And the guy thought about it for a minute and said, all of it. <laughs> Can you say that? When you get a 10 inch per hour storm event on your land, how much water runs off? Probably too much, yeah. <laughs> Gabe Brown up in uh, the Dakotas, when he started, his soil wouldn't retain any water and his neighbors still just lose all the water. He can absorb 18 inches of rain per hour. If you haven't read Gabe Brown's book, see if I can remember the name Dirt of it, From Dirt to Soil, it is worth the read. It doesn't matter how big or small your farm is, that's an excellent book. And on, our, on my website on the last page, there's a slash news that has all my recommended books on it. So this is huge two cows worth of microbial biomass alive in your soil per acre, how much do you think you get every day when they die? So I kept thinking, I need to keep adding organic matter to the surface of my soil, but I didn't even realize I can just let the plants add the organic matter below the soil where I want it in the first place. And that's why we want living roots in the soil 24-7. So, as you can tell, I'm a, little, I'm a little fired up about this stuff. Wow. How can we not know about this stuff already? Well, it's because we didn't know about this stuff until 2010. There was an Australian research team led by this really nice lady's name that I cannot pronounce. And then Dr. White did a ton more research and released a slew of papers throughout the 20 teens, ultimately culminating in a review paper in 2019. And if you're going to if you're not a big fan of reading sort of dry scientific papers, a review paper is a great one to read because it summarizes all the other research on that topic to date. And that's a good review paper to read. And if you don't want to write really fast, this presentation will be on my website as well. So you can just look back through the slides. So let's get a little bit nerdy. Endophytes are non-pathogenic organisms, such as a bacteria or fungus living within a plant. And rhizophagy, and this is a new term that was coined by that, I'm just gonna set up my clock up here so I don't run over. 
<coughs> that was coined by that Australian research term, and they basically translated as meaning eaten by roots, rhizo root phagy to eat. And this is the paper that they discovered that in. Now they, they found that the plants ate the bacteria through their roots, but what they didn't get, oh, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay, I'll, I'll continue that thought in a second. So let's go back to photosynthesis. I'm gonna breeze through this really quickly, just in case you guys have forgotten how amazing photosynthesis is. And again, the guy that elucidated this was born in 1911. He died when I was 19 years old. This is really new stuff. You've got your light reactions, you've got the Calvin cycle. So here we're taking an electron off of water, producing oxygen, that's creating energy, and that energy is then used to capture the carbon and CO2 and turn it into sugars. Two separate processes, light dependent, light independent. Basically harnessing the energy of the sun to do work. Production, also called anabolism. Producers, plants. Here's where it all happens. The chloroplast, oh, and this, these slides, I wanted to say, mostly I just wanna get you an idea of scale here. Chloroplasts are these little organelles here, and this is a, that what an actual chloroplast looks like. The, the cartoons make it a lot easier to see. So that's one micrometer, so I'm guessing that's like between three and five microns there. Chloroplast plasts are contained, contain thylakoids, which are stacked called granums, and there's an inner and outer shell that contains all this stuff, because in biochemical reactions, the way you store energy is to separate charge or chemical gradients across a membrane. And then that, when you release these charged ions through the membrane, they can actually do physical work. So again, just for scale, here's a cell. There's that tiny, tiny little chloroplast within the cell where all of that energy is being produced. And for a while, I find this really interesting. Chloroplasts are very small, almost like bacteria, and they are is hypotheses that both mitochondria, the engines in our cells that convert sugars into usable energy, and the chloroplasts that convert sunlight into stored energy were potentially separate organisms that the cells found so valuable they incorporated them into their systems. That's just a little fun fact aside. So here's another picture, a little bit more clear, showing all the structures within your chloroplast. And just for scale, so Bacteria that are gonna enter into the root zone are between one micron and five microns. And remember, there's the size of a chloroplast, around five microns. It's very hard to differentiate what these things are. So that, to me, sort of explains why it's taken us so long to figure this out. Remember my grainy picture of microbes from my compost pile at home? I couldn't tell what any of that was. <laughs> So imagine looking in a microscope, and this is all carefully stained and things are really, this is a really great, great slide. Imagine if you saw some other dots that looked sort of like that. Would you think that's just another cell organelle or would you think, oh, that's an, in, that's an invading bacteria that the root brought into its plant? I'm just speculating. And here, again, this is, I want you to focus on the contents of the slide, not the chemistry. This is photosystem one, photosystem two, this is the complex photochemical oxidation reduction reactions that produce the ATP that we then use to create the sugars. But look at this membrane. So this is the thylakoid membrane. Here's a stack of thylakoids. There's the thylakoid membrane. In that membrane, it's jam-packed with enzymes. Enzymes are functional proteins that do specific chemistry. So enzymes, 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 big enzymes. These are the, well, the membrane is made out of lipids. So this side, these little balls, they're usually phospholipids. Sometimes they're other things on the heads, but these are attracted to water. These are the greasy tails that are just hydrocarbons. It's the same as the soap bubble. It creates a sphere all by itself. They're self forming. So the hydrophobic fearing water tails stick together and the hydrophilic loving water heads line up and create a membrane and that's how you get the charge separation. Protons are created inside, you get a concentration buildup inside the thylakoid membrane and as the proton gradient is released through ATP synthase, 
this whole top thing actually turns and the structure of this enzyme changes and forces another phosphate onto the adenine diphosphate molecule to give you adenine triphosphate, a high energy molecule that can then do work. There will not be a quiz on that. <laughs> <laughs> what I want you to take home is that this membrane is full of proteins and enzymes, metals and lipids. That's what I want you to take home. Because what are proteins made out of? Who remembers this from their biology class? Correct, amino acids. They're like little building blocks, like a Lincoln Log set. You can actually tear those things apart and you have all the raw materials to build a new one ready to go. You don't have to take nitrogen and carbon and oxygen all separate and force that difficult chemistry together to create the amino acid separately. It's already here in these proteins. That will make sense later. So this is what really gets me going. Life on Earth is symbiosis at the chemical level. Here are plants storing all of this sunlight energy. Here's everything else, us included, taking that stored energy and running the same reaction in the opposite direction. The raw materials that plants need to create stored energy and their waste product, oxygen, are the raw materials that we need to do all the work that we do, and our waste products are their source products. <laughs> Just let that sink in for a minute. Animals and plants evolve together, and this one chemical reaction sums it all up. If you don't have healthy soils with healthy animals, micro animals, micro arthropods, arthropods, worms, all of it, in there to support their plants, neither of those sets of organisms are going to have what they need. So let's go on to the roots. My attempt at having a clock that stayed on has failed. 3.42, okay. What time are we done? 3, 4.30? 4.30, great, okay. We got plenty of time. This is good. On to the roots. So. The previous lab in Australia in 2010 identified that these uh, bacteria were being invited into and absorbed by the roots. And what Dr. White elucidated further and added to that was that this isn't just a one-way street. This is actually a cycle like so many things in nature, just like this cycle. We create carbon dioxide, plants take that and create oxygen. This cycle, Here's your root cap. Here's the meristem right in here. And this zone behind the meristem is where rhizophagy occurs, where the endophytes are invited into the plant root. But they don't just go in and get dissolved and consumed. They line up along these root hair buds. And when there aren't bacteria in the root hairs, this bud doesn't elongate. You just have a root hair bud. You never get a root hair. So bacteria must be present within your plant for these root hair buds to elongate and actually get all those nice root hairs that expand the amount of surface area to get that allows better absorption, all of the good things. But the bacteria go in here and the plant says, wow, this is great. I'm going to give you all you need to have a little nursery and reproduce. So they reproduce in here, and then when the, the root hair tip gets full enough, all the bacteria just diffuse out of the tip, and it starts over again. It's a complete cycle. So as your plant grows, it's actually farming the bacteria that the new roots that will come off of the tips of the roots will need to be healthier. I think I've got some more pretty pictures. Yes. So. How in the world did they get these tiny little about one micron blobs inside this root tip to show up? These are incredible photographs. I could never do that <laughs> with my little microscope. They stain them with a dye that makes them show up differently, and then they can actually watch them move. And I've got a link to a presentation where he's got some absolutely stunning videos of these microbes cycling around inside the plant roots. They also use particular strains of bacteria that have a specific growth habit so they don't look like organelles within 
normal cells. Did I forget to say anything on this slide? No. So here's the uh, Micrococcus luteus. They look like, they call them tetrads, little square clusters of four bacteria. So n there are no organelles within a plant cell that looks like a tetrad of Micrococcus luteus. So let's just go over a little bit more what happens in the Rigophagy cycle. Microbes enter behind the meristem. Here's the root cap, here's the meristem. Microbes are coming in right along in here, if I'm getting this right. Superoxide dissolves either the entire cell, if it's a bacteria the plant doesn't want, or just the cell wall. And I thought to myself, boy, that's going to be an unhappy bacteria without its cell wall. Turns out I was wrong. These protoplasts can actually replicate better. I think I wrote that in here. Yes, they replicate better without their cell wall. And when he said this in, in the lecture, I shot up my hand. I was like, hang on a minute. You're trying to tell me that these bacteria can reproduce without their cell walls? He was like, yes, it's amazing, isn't it? It is amazing. Do you have a question? No. Okay. <coughs> so nitrogen-fixing bacteria are preferentially preserved as protoplasts. And this might be because those guys are exuding nitric oxide. And when the superoxide burst that the plant treats all of the invading or invited in bacterial cells with, it actually converts that nitric oxide to nitrate. It's fertilizer right there inside the plant cell. Right there. <laughs> you didn't have to get it from the truck to the field, <laughs> into the ground, and next to the plant root, it's happening right in the cell. And they go back and repeat the process. So this, this to me just blew my mind. And I worked in a lab that studied um, immune system function for a while. And in our bodies, when we have an invading pathogen, we have these things called killer T cells, which you may have heard of antibodies stick to the invading pathogen, the killer T cells come around and identify the pathogen with the antibody, and then they engulf that invading pathogen. And only then does it kill what's inside of it with a superoxide burst or peroxide. They call them reactive oxygen species. So our bodies are like, we can't have all of this superoxide floating around in the cell. That's highly destructive stuff. It's like setting off firecrackers in your living room while you're watching television. You cannot have that going on. So then my hand shot up again. I was like, you mean this happens in the vasculature of the plant? He was like, yes. So I might have gotten ahead of myself just a little bit. So the reason the plants can do that is because they flood their vasculature with antioxidants. Heard of those phytochemicals? What do those phytochemicals and antioxidants do for, for the plants that we grow to eat? They make them taste great. <laughs> they make them really healthy. We need all of that antioxidant power. Everybody's heard of the, the latest antioxidant trend, the acai berry or blueberries or any of these plants that were always touting the antioxidant power of those plants. Well, why are plants so full of antioxidants? because the plants are intentionally releasing superoxide in their vasculature, <laughs> which is crazy. You have to have an enormous amount of antioxidants to counteract that so you don't dissolve your own cellular structure. So why do plants do this and what are the bacteria doing? Bacteria are extremely skilled at extracting micronutrients from the soil. If you don't have enough phosphorus, you think you need to ask, add phosphorus? Probably not. If you get a chemical analysis, a thorough chemical analysis of your soil, it's probably full of phosphorus, just bound up in a rock form that your plants can't access. Get the right bacteria in there, they'll go down and mine it, take it into their systems, and then the fungal hyphae will talk to the plant and say, hey buddy, what do you need? The plant says, I really want some phosphorus. So then the fungal hyphae reaches out <coughs> to the bacteria and says, dude, you got some phosphorus? There's this plant full of sugar just dying to have some. <laughs> I'm not kidding, they actually do this. There have been studies that show fungi will actually negotiate a higher price for phosphorus. They may be sitting on a ton of phosphorus bacteria full of phosphorus, and this plant only says, well, I'll give you 
10 grams of sugar for it, but this other plant way over here says, I'll give you 100 grams for it. The fungus will preferentially feed the plant way over here. <laughs> this is mind-blowing stuff. It actually happens. So we always talk about how important fungi are and how wonderful they are. I can't actually remember where I learned this fun fact. Google it, find out if I'm wrong. I don't think I am. In a single gallon of healthy soil, there are 300 miles of fungal hyphae. That's past Asheville when I drive home. And I quickly did the math right before class and just found out how many miles of corn roots there were in an acre and divided it by the square footage of the field. So this is not a direct volume to volume comparison, but you only get eight tenths of a mile for corn roots. So what does that tell you about the importance of fungal hyphae in your soil? If it's communicating with the bacteria and trading sugars from the plant to the bacteria for that stuff, what's the chance that within a gallon of soil there's going to be a fungal hyphae near a bacterial or plant root? Much higher than if there were just plant roots alone, right? So the fungal hyphae are acting as a communication, signaling, and transport conduit for the plants. You all get that? <laughs> it's crazy. Plants trade sugars for minerals, I already said that. Here's a really cool thing. The bacteria inside the roots release ethylene and nitric oxide. Those are both plant growth and signaling compounds. Cell walls themselves are made up of proteins, lipids, and carbohydrate, carbohydrates. Remember that diagram of the thylakoid membrane that I showed you? All of those big proteins in it. So when the plant roots hit those bacteria that they don't want, or even the bacteria that they do, and dissolve the cell wall, what's it getting in return? All of this stuff that are biologically available for them right there in the cell wall. It doesn't have to go assemble nitrate into an amino acid. It's getting the raw amino acids by digesting the bacterial cell within the vasculature of the plant. Nucleic acids too, so if it kills the whole thing, all the DNA of that bacteria that it just killed and ripped apart with superoxide, all those nucleic acids are available to be incorporated into its DNA when it needs to do any of its functions for storing information or transcription of DNA to proteins. Uh, yes, fast replication. Once you strip the cell wall off, the bacteria can grow a lot faster and they get distributed throughout the plant, which just blows my mind. I mean, I didn't even realize there were free living nitrogen fixing bacteria until 2020. Yes, you had a question earlier, sorry. He didn't answer that specifically, and I don't know. My guess would be yes. My guess would be that you are flooding all of the rhizosphere with the bacteria that you want because you're killing off the stuff that you don't want. Yeah, to kind of piggyback on that. Yeah. It's kind of related to like fungal bacterial ratios when you're looking. Like different plants, you know, prefer different ratios, but are, are, and sometimes we're marketed and sold, oh, this this product's you know gonna unlock phosphorus or like manatee or something. This product. It's a specific strain. Mm -hmm. I know we, we just started looking at like different strains of 2010. Mm -hmm. So how close are we to like identifying specific ones for specific yeah. purposes, or is it more about the fungal to bacterial ratio? Just all you're all just you're playing it safe. You're like, all right, I'm gonna play yep. bacterial and more fungal. And I'm gonna play it safe. Got it. Way. Yeah, those are great questions, and I don't know the answer. Okay. Um, and I'm not sure we need to know the answer. That might be one of those things where we can accept the mysteries of the universe and say, hey. If my soil is loaded with fungal hyphae and bacteria, if my ratios are right, great. If they're not, who's to say the plant isn't gonna make them right? And that's where preserving the soil structure and taking care of our soil first can make a difference. Fun fact, if you're in a pH range that's, you know, the USDA is saying, oh, that's horrible. You need to add tons of lime or you need to add whatever else to change the pH of your soil. If you have healthy soil that's full of fungi and bacteria, the pH that the root experiences because of the rhizosheaths that it can create can be up to two units different than the actual bulk pH of your soil. 
that's huge. So, you know, if you've got blueberries that want to be around six and your soil's around eight, but your blueberries look fine, am I going to spend all that money on adjusting the pH of my soil? No. I'm going to keep those bacteria happy. Yes. That's what I was going to say, too. I, I think uh, a lot of people tend to forget that plants are living, breathing things right. that control a lot of their own environment. Very true. Um, it's a point of excubate. Mm -hmm. so soil is the colony at different times of microbes, either bacteria or fungi. Yeah. Um, that's kind of how they control their pH zones, too, through the biofilm that yeah. those organisms are creating. So yeah. We've got to give the plants a lot more credit than we do. Okay, let's see here. Oh, yeah, so potentially the reason that the plants can select for the bacteria that they want in there is, and I think I may have mentioned this, the nitrogen-fixing bacteria are releasing nitric oxide, which the superoxide converts into nitrates, which the plant can use directly. And that also reduces the impact of the superoxide on that bacterial cell. So that might be why they're not getting completely killed whereas the less useful bacteria to the plant are just getting wiped out and digested and used in the plant. And this is kind of crazy. Uh, has anybody had problems with Phytophthora on their farm? Apparently it's a big problem, yes. Apparently having this healthy rhizophagy cycle going on can mediate to the point where this is just no longer a problem anymore. And apparently this is a very difficult thing to get rid of, like treating it chemically is really not easy. So just to expand on this stuff, here's a slide that I found just this morning. Um, this is kind of a square boxy representation of a cell within the root. So here's the root cell cytoplasm, here's the cell membrane, here's the root cell wall, which is porous, and these bacteria are getting into the periplasmic space between the cell membrane and the cell wall. And then the superoxide is being generated within the cytoplasm and diffusing out through the cell membrane to attack these things here. And these are not just sitting around. That's what these arrows, arrows are representing. The bacteria circulate all around here. They're moving constantly. And it's a lot of energy to make things move around and it seems like from watching the presentations that I've had that Dr. White has put online, they're not really sure why they do that. But these bacteria, when you watch his videos, they are just streaming around the root cell. You can look at the root hairs and the bacteria are just like, it's almost like they're marching around in a circle. He's speculating that maybe that helps with when the cell walls dissolve, it distributes those nutrients more and maybe lessens the impact of the superoxide on the healthy plant cell itself. Pretty much said all that stuff. Plasmic streaming, release of nutrients, uncontained superoxide release. This really drove me crazy when I heard that because our bodies go through so much care and trouble to prevent superoxide from being released into our vascular space. It's gotta be contained within that killer T cell and that high concentration of superoxide kills the invading pathogen, but it is never released out into our bloodstream. So plants can handle it. They're amazing. Let's suspect hemoglobin. Sorry? Uh, let's suspect it's hemoglobin, then we, you know, then we want that oxygen. Right, We're, but not superoxide. <laughs> we want O2, O2 neutral, not O2 minus. Right. Yeah, the superoxide is highly reactive. It's like pouring bleach <laughs> on things. It's really strong. <laughs> So here's a, a picture of um, the highly branched root tips of a grass. And this is straight out of one of his presentations. Um, but I just wanted to show you a picture of just how branched these roots are. So one of the things that happens, oh, I'm getting ahead of myself again, yep. So this is just another diagram showing the periodic buildup and release and rebuild up of endophytic bacteria as time passes. And apparently the bacteria transition from doing different things. Red bacteria are active in antioxidant nitrogen secretion and the blue are active in nitrogen fixation. And these guys, they not only circulate in the root tip but they circulate throughout the plant, into the leaves, into the hairs of the leaves, into the trichomes of the plants. 
It's pretty crazy. So what happens when we don't have the end of bytes? Somebody give me a time. Hold on. Okay, we got half an hour. What happens without end of bytes? Root hairs don't elongate. No root hairs, no branching. No or reduced free living nitrogen fixation for the bacteria in the soil and in the plant. Roots lose their ability to sense which direction to grow. That's crazy. Without the bacteria in the root tips, they don't know whether to grow up or down. You get reduced branching and elongation, less superoxide. And this, I think he said this out loud in that lecture last year at Acres, but I put a star beside it because I, I don't know if I made that up or not. It makes sense to me that it would follow if you have less superoxide, you're going to get less phytochemicals and antioxidants, but I don't hold me to it. Oh, and here are some pictures. <laughs> you can't really see them, but these guys are covered. I believe these are tomato seeds. Yeah, tomato seedlings, three days post-germination. These had endophytic bacteria on them, and these did not. And these guys are turning bound brown. They have no root hairs. You can't really see them, but there are root hairs coming off of those. How have we impacted into fights? Four major ways that come to mind for me are plant breeding, chemical fertility, tillage, and pesticides. And Jonathan Lundgren, the founder of Blue Dasher Farm up in the Dakotas, um, he says that tillage is the number one destructive farming practice, which kind of blew me away because his primary research was on pesticides and how damaging they were. But he was like, nope, it's tillage. How have we impacted endophytes, plant breeding? Frequently, when you're germinating seeds in lab conditions, they're grown up in sterile media that have, may have even had antibiotics put in them to keep bacteria from growing in that media. So we are stripping away the potential natural colonies of bacteria that those plants want and need. Varieties grown out frequently for seed companies using tillage and chemical fertility. Again, we've impacted the natural microbial community of that soil and the plants will not have those microbes available to encapsulate in their seeds when they're passed on and packaged for sale. Chemical fertility. Plants stop the production of root exudates when they have everything they're going to need, right? If they think, oh gosh, I've got all the nitrogen I need, why am I going to spend 30 percent of my photosynthetic capacity to give to the soil if I already have it? So if we flood a plant with nitrogen, it stops root exudates. It's not going to do it anymore. As a result, we get reduced tolerance to oxidative stress. A hot, dry day where the sun's bearing down on things, you get all kinds of free radical production within the plants, and they just can't handle it. Doesn't happen if you've got a healthy microbiome and bacteria inside your plants. Of course, chemical fertility will directly kill bacteria and fungi. Plants become addicted and dependent to the chemical input, because if you suddenly withdraw the chemicals, the drugs that are keeping your plants alive, there's no bacterial community there to step in and support it because we've wrecked that as well. Chemical fertility requires more energy and water to convert to biological useful forms. When you dissolve a bacterium right next to the cell with superoxide, you've got all the building blocks you need of nature, the lipids, the amino acids, <clears throat> all of the good things I showed you on that previous slide. When you feed a plant raw nitrogen, it's got to convert that into a functional form that it can use, and that requires extra water. Uh, oh, I can't remember his first name. Hetrick, he's a local farmer down in Hickory, broke the world corn yield record using regenerative practices last year, I believe, maybe the year before. He has an excellent presentation on um, the chemistry specifically of corn fertility and just how much more water you need when you apply chemical fertility to your corn plants. It needs a lot more. Roots tend to follow a mobile chemical nutrient path deeper in the soil profile, which can frequently be more anaerobic than a nice top fluffy soil profile full of organic matter. And this winds up in anaerobic conditions further down, which prevent the plant from being able to produce superoxide because there's no oxygen down there. The plants get oxygen from the air in the soil. So if their plants are too far down in an anaerobic zone, they can't 
access oxygen from the atmosphere, they can't produce superoxide, they can't kill bacteria within their systems and they can be overrun by bacteria that will then shift into being pathogenic. That's one really interesting thing about both bacteria and fungi in the soil, depending on the conditions, they can either support the plant or they can be pathogenic to the plant. So there's kind of a Goldilocks zone that you want to maintain. And of course, if you don't have a microbiome for the plant to absorb, it can't pass it on to the seed. Tillage. How comfortable are you going to be sleeping in a bedroom that's had the wall ripped off by an excavator? Not real well. Structures in soil are highly complex and very well organized to promote bacterial life. All of these little microbes that live in soil actually live just fine in water. They need to have little pockets covered with slime and goo and pus. That's where they're happy. So if we rip that open and expose that to the air and the harsh rays of the sun, all their little habitat gets wrecked. All the things you know already. Compaction, shifts in uh, pH, and I don't know if you know EH just stands for redox potential. Shift the balance of the microbial community. Oxidation of or organic matter. There's a lot of photochemistry that happens on the surface of soil particles between reactive uh, metal ions, iron, manganese, molybdenum, cobalt, magnesium, all of them, they're photochemically active. And if you expose them to the air, they get oxidized to a level that's more difficult for the plant to use. Pesticides. This could be a week-long lecture, so I just mentioned a book that if you really want to find out what we're doing to ourselves and our ecology, read Our Toxic Legacy here. Um, Dr. Stephanie Seneff, it's a little bit heavy on the chemistry, but you don't have to understand it all. You can get through the first couple chapters and read the rest of it. But I just have to point out, and this was really a great bit of information from Dr. Lundgren's talk. He did a survey of farms all over the country, and he found on chemically-based farms, they had 10 times the insect damage than farms that were not using chemicals, no pesticides, no fertilizers. They weren't doing anything fancy or specific to kill those pests. They just had healthier plants that could resist them. 10 times less damage. Xerces Society, I went to a pollinator workshop they gave Actually, it was in Hickory, too. They classify 2% of all insect species on this planet as agricultural pests. How selective are our pesticides? Very few are selective to the species level. So when you spray an insecticide to kill the pests on your plants, are you OK with 98% collateral damage? That's a lot. And here's a, you guys know what I'm talking about with trophic levels. Bacteria gets eaten by, by a little worm, she gets eaten by a little bird, she gets eaten by a bigger bird, <laughs> eaten by a fox. Each time something eats something else, that's called a trophic level. So for a population of earthworms to be happy eating little bacteria, you have to have a lot of bacteria because one earthworm will eat thousands of bacteria. For one bird to be happy, you gotta have thousands of earthworms. So what I'm trying to get at here is, if you don't have any of this 2% around, how are you gonna attract the predators that will naturally eat them? You can't. Every trophic level needs the food that it wants to eat. So if you've got aphids, great. Wait for the ladybugs. Wait for the lace wings. Let them come in and do their job. But here's the catch. You have to wait. Because if you don't have a critical population of your pest, you are never going to get a critical population of your predator. So when I see a problem, and granted, I don't know if you saw on the sheet, I'm not in production right now, so I know some of you guys like, I've got to harvest this crop. What am I going to do? I can't let these aphids wipe out my hoop house. It's fall. <laughs> They're here. So you're in a little bit of a pinch there. Do the awkward 
thing, the thing that's less effective but leaves some of those aphids alive and still lets you sell a crop. Because then you can get that predator population built up, make sure they've got the habitats to survive, and when the aphids come back, they'll be ready next time. <clears throat> so I think we probably covered most of this. Do your best to reduce or eliminate chemical fertility, follow good soil health practices, inoculate the soil with a diverse, healthy microbial population. Does anybody here know how to make Johnson Sioux compost? Somebody does, great. If you don't know about that, just Google it or go to the news page on our website and search for Johnson Sioux. That composting method is really easy. The trick is to keep it moist. I put a auto water on a timer in my hoop house for the barrels that have my Johnson Sioux compost and it waters it for a minute every day. I've never seen compost so full of healthy nematodes, bacteria, fungi. It's incredible. And you can take just five pounds of that raw compost, mix it in 10 to 20 gallons of water, and spray that on your field on a rainy day. And guess what? You've just injected all of that microbiology into your field. Yeah? Do you use the, the gore like the Johnson Sue, like they do? Or do you like, I know people use leaf litter? You can make it with anything. Okay. It really doesn't matter. As long as you keep it with moist and you inoculate it with something. Yeah. Once it gets past the thermophilic stage and starts to cool off, get those earthworms on top of it and let them do the work. Nicole Masters liked to say, who knew the elixir of life came out of an earthworm's butt? <laughs> <laughs> Plant heirloom biologies if you can. Use open pollinated seed. Support regenerative farms. Invite nature into your farm. This, I can't stress how important that is. For a while, every fifth row on our farm was a flower row to attract pollinators. Again, I'm a special case. I can do crazy stuff like that because I'm not currently dependent on that farm for revenue. But everywhere you can put in a flower and cover crop or let a fence row go wild and crazy, that's where all the bugs are going to be. And guess where those bugs have been? On another wild plant. Guess what those wild plants are covered with? Healthy bacteria. So when they come and visit your plants, they're going to transfer that stuff. When the bees come in and pollinate, well, if you're going to fill your honey crop with nectar, you got to let something else out, right? <laughs> well, you're going to poop all of those healthy bacteria right on the soil. Everything that comes on and off of your farm in a natural ecosystem way is going to help support it. You've got a soil food web. You've got the insect food web. You've got the bird food web. Invite it all in. You'll get that diversity back. Cover crops, cover crops, cover crops. They can be a challenge. You can do it. If, you're, if your big challenge was, how the heck can I get that cover crop out of there so I can plant without spraying or tilling, you can do it. Has anybody watched uh, Farming with Carp YouTube channel? That's a pretty fun one. He's in, I think he's in Indiana. He's got a couple of thousand acres, I think, Eric on, Carpenter. no, farming with carp, C-A-R-P, like the fish. Mm -hmm. Just Google that, or look that up on YouTube. Another guy, ugh, I'll have to look that up. There, there are tons of people doing this on a large, large scale, tens of thousands of acres where they're doing full cover crops. Some crazy people are planting soybeans directly into living winter rye and getting a crop out of it. I don't know how they do it, but they're doing it. Yes. So I, I have a home garden. Um, I haven't put any seeds in for a cover crop yet this year. Is there anything that I should still sow for a cover crop this time of year? So, so the, the answer to every question that comes to a farmer is it depends. <laughs> <laughs> but generally, yes. If, if at this time of year, it's getting on the edge. If, I don't know if you saw Pam Dawlings talk about um, succession planting, but she said this time of year in her area in Virginia Zone 7A, the cutoff date for being able to plant winter rye is like next week. So you're getting close. But you can still get something <laughs> in. And if you get lucky with some rain and some warm weather, which we will probably have a little bit more warm weather, you'll be okay. So if you want to feed your plants, feed the microbes. Oh. Who can list those soil health principles for me? This is the quiz. Go ahead, shout them out. You know what they are. Soil covered. Minimize disturbance. Living roots. Diversity. You got it. If you can integrate livestock, read that book by Gabe Brown. It's just fascinating. And what time is it? We have 4.15 and we're done at 4.30? Okay. I'm going to give you guys the option now. 
I had hoped we would have enough time for you all to just turn to like four or five people that you don't know, say hi, exchange business cards, Instagram accounts, whatever, and address the challenges that you think you're gonna face to try and improve the biological diversity in your soil. So that's option one. Option two is I can just take questions for the next 15 minutes. What do you guys want? No preference at all? <laughs> option two? Okay, well do me a favor and just turn to somebody that you don't know. <laughs> right now, turn to them and introduce yourself. I'll give me just five minutes. chance okay, look, look for that on YouTube yeah no, I, that's I, a I, great presentation uh, I, my father has a soil science degree nice. uh, I was pulled in third grade I was too retarded to read by my teacher and so I got pulled out of school and performed <laughs> a rigorous course of self-study yeah and so the only thing I'm a subject matter expert in is myself right uh, but I happen to be a biological system yes so that's I'm right getting, right. <laughs> that's exactly um, right so you know I have a nice sordid past like most people in my generation sure but I'm ready to be a research scientist and I'm signing on with biotech because we are the most advanced biotech right <laughs> all right um, and this is all data that is new to me just so you know a lot of what you presented here yeah. uh, that are all um, factors that need to be uh, included in these studies that I'm doing so uh, if you do these lectures regularly I'm, I'm autistic That's okay. so I need to learn something three times yeah three times no before I really get it I'm dyslexic yeah. every time I did a calculation in graduate school I had to do it three times yeah I get it I and get uh, it. It's okay. I mean, we, we have what we have, and we make the best of it, and we move forward. Absolutely, absolutely. You're in Asheville. That's right. So I just, I've been in Murphy for the last uh, two years, Me. and I'm moving to this area because I want to be around people that have, uh, you know, a, cool. two grain cells to knock together. But um, Let's chat after the talk, yes. okay? I'm going to get book one. Okay. Thank you all for... Thank you all for uh, humoring me. We, yeah, we're going to open up for questions now. Thank you all for taking the time to meet your neighbor. I hope uh, you got to uh, exchange some information and maybe make a new friend who can support you in your journey with a slightly different perspective. Eliminate your own paradigm blindness. We've got 10 more minutes. And I'm happy to answer any questions you have in here to then, and then we'll have to leave, but we can continue out in the hallway if we need to. We've got a question here. I've got a question, but I don't know if I expect an answer. I just really kind of want your opinion. Uh, based on what you're saying, how does this relate to nutrient balancing, and, and what is your opinion on doing that in light of what you've learned? Okay, so if I could have your attention, please. We've got a question on the floor from the gentleman over here in the corner, and his question was, what does this mean for nutrient balancing? And sadly, my answer is, I don't know. 
I, yeah, that's right. That is the answer. If the plants answer. are happy. If the plants are happy. My guess and my observation from my own little farm is that you can stop worrying about a whole array of things if you've got your soil health up to par. So does it handle nutrient balancing? Probably. I find that, um, so here's, here's my favorite place on my little farm, the compost piles. <laughs> And that's biochar that I make with a, I had a firewood maker on the one field of the farm and he would give me all the scraps. So I'd make biochar in an open pit, mix that in with my compost, mix it all up. And that seems to have helped things quite a lot. The, uh, the, the hoop house and the area that you can't see behind, there's, there's a little hula bed under all these wild um, asters. Our farm was gravel from the front of that barn all the way up past here. I've never used any chemical fertility on that farm. I've only applied finished compost and it's taken some time, but after about five years, it seems like I have a healthy ecosystem functioning in the soil and I almost don't have to do anything. The only adjustment I've done is the soil in the hoop house seemed to be a little bit low in calcium. So I did apply a little bit of calcium to that one year and a little bit of boron. And I mean a little bit. <laughs> Don't want to overdo your boron. Um, like a teaspoon for 2,000 square feet. <laughs> Very little. Um, and that took care of it. I had some blossom end rot and now as long as I irrigate regularly and I don't let that house get too hot, I don't have any fans in it because I hate burning that power. Ah, that's not true. I've got, a, it's a double layer. So I've got one of those little 100 watt fans that inflates the layers. But other than that, I have not, I've not used any chemical fertility whatsoever on that farm and I grow some really tasty food. So I'm sorry I don't have the answer to your question. I think it will help the balancing because when you get that many organic molecules in your soil and that much life going on, if there's an excess in one area, something's gonna eat it. And if it's too much nitrogen, which is usually the case on most conventional farms, it's gonna get off gassed. And if it's a deficiency in somewhere else, something else is going to fill in and help it. The biology will help you so much. Other questions? I have a question. Yes, uh, I saw her hand first. One second. Yeah, go ahead. So things happen in the soil. We do what we do. Yeah. Maybe there's not microclip. Do you have ideas or recommendations on, like, could I give the plants a little bit of help? Yeah. <laughs> not like, you know, just is there yes. a mix other than the, the compost that we mentioned? So if you're not familiar with, um, Advancing Eco Agriculture, John Kemp's company, who strongly supports the Acres USA conference, he has some products that actually work. A lot of times you go into your local store and you find some really expensive mix of bugs in a jug, but it's in a sealed container and it's been on the shelf for three weeks. How many of those bugs are still alive in that jug? Probably none. And if you're lucky, <laughs> some, but they may not be the ones that started off there. So. For me, the best thing that you can do is not to go to the store. You don't need anything with a barcode on it at your farm. That's what you need on your farm right there. And if you don't have that, if you don't have access to the raw materials for this, go to chipdrop.com and pay somebody 30 bucks to bring you two loads of wood chips and then let them sit there for two years. And in two years, you'll have this. So if you want to get fancy with it and kickstart it faster, go buy some really good compost from somewhere and inoculate your pile of chips, keep it well watered, let it do its thing. And that's going to be the source of your microbes. If you don't want to buy it, go off into the woods near your farm, get a little bit of soil, dump it in a bucket of water, aerate it overnight, pour that on your compost. The biology is there and it's free. All of the wild organisms are still out there. We've only wrecked them on our farms because we didn't know any better. It's not like we went out to destroy our farms. We just didn't know any better. Thanks to these reductionist scientists like Dr. White, we're learning. And we can really turn things around fast. Save a lot of money, have less weeds, eliminate the toxins in our food supply, practically for free. Yes? Are you familiar with the uh, Gazam method? The I have read a little bit about that. Jam, jam yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. I've used that with a lot of things. Great, so he just suggested uh, the Jadam, J-A-D-A-M. So I've heard great things about that. I've not done it to the letter, but I do similar stuff. I just have like a, 
All you need is leaf mold and soft, soft water. Soft not, water? Uh, not hard water. Soft water makes a big difference. Okay. Filter water? Uh, still, like not, not, hard, not, not very heavy, not a high. Nothing from the tap. Nothing okay. from the tap. Yeah, not from yeah. the tap. So. Just around here where it's very mineral rich. Yeah, okay. Right. Okay. That makes I have well water. I don't use that. I use rainwater. Okay. Well, rainwater is better. Okay, great. So you can collect some rainwater. Other questions? I let the compost inoculate the biochar. That's a great question. Um, it's easy for me because I, I have so much of it and so much compost. Right before my last turn of the pile, I dig that trough across the top of it, fill it with char, and then I move it into the next bay so it gets mixed in well. And then a year later, I'll use it. We've got four minutes. Yes. Um, so these microbes in the plant die, that dries up, they go dormant, um, uh, and then do they migrate down like and how far would they migrate down to where you would be able to revive them those are great questions <laughs> <laughs> i'm pretty sure the answer is it depends <laughs> if there's plenty of rain and you've got a nice moist season a lot of those microbes are going to get washed down if it's super dry they're probably going to stay in their dormant state um i don't usually let stuff um ah, it depends sometimes i'll chop and drop in the furrows or sometimes right on the rows. I'm such a small scale, I can do that. A lot of times I'll collect and take to the compost and let them break down there. So I know if I bury them in the compost pile, they're gonna have an environment that they can reproduce in. So, it depends. How about burying? Everybody talks about burying them all the time. Bury them? Hmm. I don't know anything about burying them. Okay. Interesting. Well, that's, that's another uh, additive that everyone is trying to look to. to okay. Add to for uh, leaf health. Okay. Boron, I'm sorry. Boron. Boron, Boron. okay. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Big difference there. <laughs> yeah. Boron is a, is a pretty important micronutrient, but it is, it, you've got to keep it small. Like, mm -hmm. that, there are a few things on your soil, your standard soil test that you can really trust. Um, because they're using a, a harsh chemical analysis to do those tests. You're much better off using one of the, oh, I'm going to forget the name of them now. Uh, Region Ag Lab is a good lab to go to, and there's a new type of test. I'm so sorry, I've forgotten the name of it. Does anybody know? Haney, Haney soil test. That gives you a much better picture because they don't use the harsh acids to do the extraction to find out the ratios of concentrations of things. And I do soil tests, and I look at them, and I'm like, mm, that's nice. But, you know, if, the, if they're telling me I need to add 500 tons of whatever per acre for this, I'm like, no, nah, I don't think so. Because I know the biology in my soil will go get that for me. I don't need to bring it in. It's already there. Yeah. Right. That's right. If you, if you have almost all soils in the United States, and that's, that's another thing that Johnson Sue really got me fired up about. He took that Johnson Sioux compost and applied like a one inch layer on desert sand and he grew vegetables off of that for four years. <laughs> so desert sand has everything your plants need to grow. They can't get to it without the biology. So if you apply the biology, they can access the minerals that they need from that sand. Because I mean, when you think about it, most of what a plant needs is carbon dioxide and water. <laughs> All of that structure you see is made from cellulose carbon. All of the carbon the plant uses comes from the air. Most of the nitrogen it uses comes from the air. It's there. We've got <laughs> nitrogen fixing bacteria. Now we know in the vasculature of the plant, if we functionalize that and let it do its job, it will. Anything else? What time do we have? We've got one minute. Have you ever heard of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle? <laughs> <laughs> You've got to look at the system. Yeah. Thank you all very much. You've been a great audience. Yeah. Thanks for coming. Yeah, thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. I appreciate that.
I like your uh, your idea that there's some things we just don't know. Yeah, I'll and that's it. okay. Yeah.